Welcome. I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to the event tonight. I'm Tim Grohling. I'm the outgoing chair of the Communication Studies Department. This is the, uh, yeah, sad for you, nice for me. <laughs> so this is the uh, sixth year of uh, my term and uh, my colleague Greg, where is Greg? Yeah, Greg Bryant is gonna be stepping in as my interim chair before the dean selects the new chair. Um, I wanted to thank you all for joining us to our first public event since our 40th anniversary uh, celebration that took place in the same room uh, a little while ago. Um, Sandy Grushow, who most of you know, is a communication studies graduate, uh, 1983. At the age of 32, Sandy became president of the Fox Entertainment Group's entire network division, making him one of the youngest executives to ever hold the title of network president. During his leadership at Fox, he oversaw the development of some of my actual favorite TV shows ever, including The X-Files, Melrose Place, not those two. Uh, <laughs> Party Five, X-Files sometimes, anyway. So, um, Mad TV, Boston Public, American Idol, 24, The OC, which I've heard somebody actually was inspired to move to California based on The OC. Um, the Bernie Mac Show, if I could, House, and many others. Any others ones you wanna shout out to? That's good, okay. Um, Currently, he is CEO of Phase Two Media, a company composed of both a uh, strategic advisory practice and a television and digital production company. Sandy is serving as our 2016 Bruin in Residence for the department, which is a program that welcomes notable alumnus to campus for several days to get a true Bruin experience within the Communication Studies department. Bruin in Residence has the opportunity to meet with faculty, guest lecture in the classroom, and hold office hours and inter informational interviews with students. David Newman, who is uh, also, as I mentioned, a graduate of our program in 1983, is a principal of Black Rock Productions. He served as a president of Walt Disney Television, chief programming officer at CNN, vice president of comedy division at NBC, and is currently the president executive producer of Black Rock Productions, which focuses on film, television, and digital media. David served as our inaugural Bruin in Residence last year, and we are glad to welcome him back to help participate in the program this year by interviewing Sandy. So join me in giving both of them a big hand. Thank you very much, everyone. Sandy. David. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, big news today. Uh, big announcement in Variety. Would you like to tell everybody about that? I think it's quite exciting. Uh, it requires a little bit of context. Uh, after spending 25 years at Fox um, in traditional media, starting in the movie business and then moving over to television, uh, and so I decided to um, get uh, a second education um, because I knew very little about the space. And I started to spend time down in uh, Silicon Beach at what's called uh, accelerators. Um, these are companies that give young entrepreneurs, you know, $50,000, $100,000 office space and bring in mentors to, to help them build their businesses. And I just went down there um, and, and was more than happy to try to be helpful and uh, was learning. So there was certainly something in it for me. And um, after I would meet with some of these young entrepreneurs, they would say, dude, that was actually pretty helpful. Would you sit on our board or our advisory board? And I just started to say yes. And it sort of very organically evolved into an advisory practice. And now I've got about 30 companies that uh, I work pretty closely with. Uh, and a uh, lot of uh, companies in, in the media space uh, that um, are either, you know, they're building products that are either disruptive to traditional media or will help media companies expand their businesses or make their businesses more efficient. And what I try to do is I sit down with them because these technologists, are, genuinely smart people, um, many of them from Northern California, and they start building these products that they think are relevant for the Hollywood ecosystem. And as it turns out, you know, some of them are, but most of them need some refinement. Um, and so I try to work with them in terms of uh, refining their product and helping them put together a go-to-market strategy, you know, sort of creating the narrative uh, and then I walk them into movie studios, television networks, uh, and um, you know, sort of introduce these products and services to people I used to work with. Um, and they're very gracious about um, allowing me to bring young folks in. 
And uh, a lot of these companies have, have gotten significant traction uh, in Hollywood. And uh, the, the company that David's mentioning today is called Three Black Dot. Um, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but I have a, uh, uh, now a 16-year-old. When he was about 12, um, he would be in his room, and I would hear cackling. I mean, just like a ridiculous amount of laughter. Of course, I was sitting outside his room thinking, well, he's clearly discovered a Jim Carrey movie or, you know, Ben Stiller. And I, I would go into his room, and he was in front of his laptop, and he was watching young guys play video games and comment on the games. And, right? Heads not. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, how is that funny? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't get it. And, you know, really, I just walked out of his room and I shrugged and I realized that there was stuff going on in the world that I was just never going to understand. Um, uh, but it doesn't stop me, you know, for actually trying to help these people. A anyway, um, what these young kids were doing was they were making, they were popularizing um, video games that they had no ownership position in. So they were third-party video games. Um, and they would make some money on YouTube um, via advertising revenue. Um, but what they really wanted to do was own their own games. So this company came together um, through Black Dot, and now they're actually producing their own video games and marketing them. Uh, and of course, they needed capital to be able to do that. Um, and uh, as a member of their board of advisors, I one day um, uh, considered Legendary Entertainment as a, as a possible a uh, great strategic partner who might also be interested in investing some money because uh, Legendary it, um, famously targets the young male demographic, 18 to 34. Anyway, made the introduction. Uh, uh, Legendary got it completely. Uh, they they uh, made a significant multi-million dollar investment on the back of uh, strategic partnership and that was announced today, and that, that's what David was referring to. Do you think this might become a one of what they're calling a unicorn now? You know, the uh, for those who, does everybody know what the unicorn, <clears throat> raise your hand if you know what a unicorn refers to. They're, they're this category of uh, startup that becomes truly a mega success, like a Facebook or a Twitter or a, uh, you know, something at that level. They call it a unicorn. Yeah. It's what everybody yeah. wants. It's the new religion in uh, Silicon Beach and Silicon Valley as you want to try to develop a unicorn and build a right. unicorn. Yeah, look, I'm not going to lie. I mean, that's, that's the hope, <laughs> right? You know, you, you, you take equity in these companies in, in exchange for, um, you know, sort of your advisory work or, or your ability to raise money or, or whatnot. Um, but uh, it's tough. You know, there's, there's, there's only a handful of them. Right. And it scares the heck out of me because I think a lot of kids are leaving college today. Um, I have a 19-year-old. And, and the idea of going inside a big company and starting at the bottom in the mailroom or as an intern and working your way up, it, 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 it's Who'd like I'm, do speaking that? An, I'm speaking another language, <laughs> right? They have ideas for businesses. So I refer to it as the Mark Zuckerberg effect. Right. So... Um, I know you probably love all your children equally, uh, so to speak, and on the professional side. But you're you're involved in quite a number of companies. Are there any of there one or two others that you want to highlight and say I just smell a big success with this, or tell us anything about them? Well, there's one that that's already you know sort of popped. Uh, it's called Tradesy, uh, and it's an online marketplace for women to uh, buy and sell clothes out of their closet. And uh, I met this woman at, at an accelerator down in Silicon Beach. It was called Launchpad LA. And um, I was introduced to her, and I asked her what her biggest challenge was, and she said customer acquisition costs. And, and I s looked at her, and I said, let me ask you a question. If I could somehow create a cable television series which would integrate your platform, uh, how valuable would that be? And she looked at me like, is that a trick question? And I said, you know, no. She said, well, how much of my company do you want to own? And I said, uh, right now I don't want to own any of your company, right? I'm here as a mentor. I'm here to try to be helpful. If I'm able to get a television show on the air, I'm sure we'll have an appropriate discussion about, you know, um, those issues. 
And as luck would have it, um, you know, actually, I, I left the office, and I'm sure she thought she was never going to hear from me again. Uh, and I went to an unscripted production company that, that I knew called 5x5, Five Five, and I talked to them about this company. And within a half an hour, we had sort of cracked an idea for a television show. I called her, and again, she was shocked to hear from me. Um, and I pitched the idea, and she said, I think it's great. Um, she said, well, what do we do now? I said, I don't know. Um, uh, let me, you know, let me think about it. And, and it was clear to me that it would live on like a TLC or a lifetime of female skewing cable network. But I have a very good friend uh, named Park, Mark Pedowitz, who's the chairman of uh, the CW. And I called Mark on a lark and I said, I just want to come over and pitch this show to you because you guys are in the business of speaking to young women, and I'd love for you to give me some notes so that I could take it out and pitch it to cable networks. So we all went over to the CW, and she was looking around like, you know, she couldn't believe it. Uh, and as we're pitching the show, in the room they said, stop, we want to buy it. And I was flabbergasted. We call that a good meeting. That was a good right, meeting. Exactly. That was, that was a good meeting. Now, there's bad news and then there's good news. The bad news is uh, we went out and we shot a presentation and they decided they didn't want to put any more unscripted shows on the air. The good news is it didn't matter. Her business is now worth north of $300 million. That's a beautiful she thing. Just, she, just, she just raised uh, $30 million from Kleiner Perkins, which is a big venture capital firm. And the, the most prestigious, arguably. Uh, um, and yeah, company. so, you know, um, that's... That's kind of how it happens. What's the biggest challenge, Sandy, of coming from traditional media, and you, you learn from some of the smartest people in traditional media, and then transitioning over to the world of you know, the sort of new digital uh, entrepreneurial universe? What, what, were, what are the traps that you fell into, and or <laughs> you know, what are the smart things and what are the dumb things that you, have, that you sort of learned? Uh, well, I would say this is not false humility, because it, it really is true. Um, one of the biggest challenges is feeling like the dumbest guy in the room, right? Absolutely. When, when these technology guys start to talk about their businesses, um, I don't know what the hell they're talking about half the time, right? Uh, and uh, Is the learning curve kicked in? In other words, it, do you find yourself much more at ease with all well, that what now? Well, I, what I realized is um, part of the problem is they don't know how to speak English. Um, <laughs> Right, and so what would what would happen is that 15 minutes into these meetings, where you know my eyes were rolling back in my head, uh, the light would start to flicker, and and I would say, let me ask you a question. Do you mean to say this? And they'd go, yes. And I would say, well, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, they they have. It's uh, like. It's like you came from marketing, where the very first thing you're taught how to do is present something simply and cogently, and they came from engineering, where that's actually right. not prized in the same way. I refer to yeah. it as, as the narrative, yeah. right? right? They don't know how to tell stories, right? They, um, and, and so um, they need people to actually help them do that. Uh, and, and so that, that's become you know, sort of my niche since... Yeah. I'm a storyteller. Tell me if something stands out for you, a salient thing you've learned where you were like, you know what, I was dumb before and this has made me a lot smarter. I, I, there is no one point. I mean, I get smarter every day, right? You know, what I, what, what I realized was after 25 years um, uh, in traditional media, the movie business, and then mostly on, on the network television side, um, I knew everything there was to know. Right? It didn't mean I was any more capable of, of being involved in a successful television series, right? But I understood every aspect of the business. Um, in, in this new world, every day is, you know, it really is a, a learning experience. And, um, you know, I, 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 I've been facing it this week. As I've been a Bruin in Residence, I've been on the phone with, you know, several of the companies I'm, I'm working with. So one of the companies is called uh, 2B TV. Are all of you familiar with something called uh, OTT or over the top? All right. So if you have a Roku device, 
or if you have Apple TV, basically what you're doing is you're watching um, television over the top, right? Meaning it's uh, delivered via the internet as opposed to cable or they, they, would, so they call it over the top. My background on that is they call it over the top because it's over the paywall right. that exists in cable television. So you're, <laughs> Correct. You're sort of going over the paywall to go directly to the internet and just pull it to yourself without having to use the cable operator and pay them. However, you do have to buy a box, yep. right? Um, and, and then you actually have to buy content a la carte, which is a, is a good segue to this company, um, 2B TV. What they've done is they've gone out and they've licensed a lot of high quality, long form content. Uh, movies, television shows, um, which is hard for a young startup company to do because typically in Hollywood, um, studios will demand what's called an MG, which is a minimum guarantee. Right? They won't just do a rev share. Their attitude is, you got to give us money first. You, you got to make it worth our while. Correct. We're not going to spend all this time and energy and legal time and management time for something that might yield us $25,000. Correct. It's, it's, let's start with a million and then we'll... Correct. It starts to get interesting. These guys have managed to um, uh, get programming from Paramount. Um, I helped them a little bit with, with Lionsgate and, and MGM. Um, and, and they've got a real, you know, they've got a real business. Uh, the, and it's free, right? So that's the hook. Unlike Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime, um, you can actually watch this channel for free. Um, they got a problem, though, which is that nobody knows about it. Right? They go to Madison Avenue, because it is ad-supported. You're getting paid one of two ways in the world. You're either getting paid by a subscription directly from, you know, from consumers or by advertisers. And they go to Madison Avenue, and Madison Avenue looks at them and goes, what the hell is Tubi TV? Right, so they have a real awareness issue, and back in the day when I was when I was at Fox and, and in the beginning of the Fox Network in in '88, um, figured out that we had to get off our own air, which is a story unto itself. Uh, we had a lot of money, a lot of resources, but more than having a lot of a lot of resources, a lot of you know money, um, there were uh, uh, platforms. We didn't call them platforms back then, but you know there were there was media that one could buy to reach America, right? There was radio, there was cable. There wasn't a lot of cable, but there was some cable. There was a little thing called TV Guide. Uh, so so you could actually well and, sell by, and, and you had TV Guide, which made it really simple. If you bought an ad in TV Guide, you're going to reach 50 million people or 75 million people or whatever. Right. So it became a kind of uh, uh, a game that was easy to understand and a playbook that was uh, pretty simple. Correct. Right? Um, bottom line is, you, you could reach America. Um, today, the world is so fragmented. First of all, very few people listen to terrestrial radio. Right? They listen to satellite radio. Right? So advertisers have very little access to people who are listening to the radio. Um, cable ratings and broadcast ratings are, are plummeting. Um, it just, it's just, it's terribly difficult to reach an audience, particularly when you have very little money. And when you raise three and a half million dollars to start a company, you know, you can't go out there and, and buy a spot, you know, in the Super Bowl, right? Because that in and of well, itself you could buy one spot. That's <laughs> right. exactly. And wipe out your entire yes. company. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but uh, so uh, this other company that, that I work with is called ShareAbility. And what this company does is it creates... Um, shareable content. You know, what does that mean? They, they create videos um, uh, uh, which uh, they uh, attempt to get uh, people to share with all of their friends, right? Um, and that is basically free. If I see something that I like and, and, and I start sharing it with people, you know, it takes on the network effect, right? So what we're going to now try to do is I'm going to try to put these two companies together to try to create a shareable 2B TV video um, uh, for 2B TV with shareability. This is a whole new world. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I actually think, you know, and I've been a consumer of media obviously my whole life, and I've, I was a comp studies major because of my interest in media. 
I think the world of media today is so goddamn exciting, I can't see straight. I think it's so exciting, so amazing, so much possibility. Do you feel the same way? I, I do, it, but, but I also feel the pain of, you know, the incumbents. Yeah. I, we were talking yeah. about, you know, yesterday, sort of the, the, something called the innovator's dilemma. Um, you know, you've got these companies that, you know, that Disney and Time Warner and News Corp and, you know, Comcast, all of these companies, their businesses are under siege. Yeah. And, and yet, they're still printing money. Yeah. But, but, you know, at the same time, as somebody who's sort of been, you know, on all sides of this game, I got approached by an executive recruiter for one of the big media companies. And there's a cable channel that they're looking for somebody to head. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what it's going to be like to have that job? Every day, you're going to walk in and you're going to watch your market share go down another little notch and another little notch every day. And you know what? I've been in companies when you get to that point on the graph where this notch reach, reaches the revenue curve, you know, and it just turns into such a, you know, kind of death spiral kind of thing. So it's very intimidating. Now, this doesn't happen to be a job that appeals to me or is interesting to me, but I do feel at the same time as how exciting it is, if you're an incumbent, absolutely terrifying. Yeah, you know? it's, it's more exciting you know, for the disruptor, right? It's right. more exciting for the kids up in Silicon Valley who, who are you know, trying to take everybody's lunch. Now, on that note, you were one of the original disruptors because you were at Fox, which was the insurgent network. You know? as, my, as my boss at NBC once dismissed it as the coat hanger network. Correct, referring Brandon to Tartico. That you needed a coat hanger to, to attach to the back of your TV set to get the signal of the it was, uh, Fox affiliates. It was yeah. really... That's a real antique joke, I have to explain. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody under the age of 40, you know, it, he had these things. It was know. really nasty of him to have said that. I know, it was. <laughs> he was a little bit like Donald Trump in that he knew how to make the quip that everybody would pick up in the media. And yeah. I'm sure, but frankly, I'm sure it just served to make you guys even more aggressively want to show him up. Right? And we did. And you did, yes, you yeah. did. And, it ain't and, bragging if it's true. Yeah, as, uh, and, as, and we did. Uh, right, and, and tell us a little bit about, you worked for two of the, you know, I think not even arguably, two of the media geniuses <coughs> of our lifetime, Barry Diller and Rupert Murdoch. Tell us a little bit about what it was like to work with each, and if you could illustrate sure. that with an anecdote for each, that would be fun. Yeah, it was actually, I would add, uh, Peter Chernin. Right, absolutely. Right. Um, and Jamie Kellner wasn't chopped liver either. Yeah. Right? It, was a, so it was an A team was of, a really, of really with, with not only, and each one of them have had multiple successes, is the interesting thing about, about that. But tell us, tell us about, I, 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 Barry and, and, and Rupert are arguably the most colorful, and right. so that's why I zero in on those. Yeah. Well, we know them, but some of these people don't. Yeah, and we talked about this the yeah. other day. You know, I was actually in the film business and having a great time. I was in feature film marketing. And I was 27 years old, and I was flying first class to Manhattan and meeting with Mike Nichols and showing him posters for Working Girl and, and staying, you know, in a beautiful hotel. And I was pinching myself. I thought this is the greatest life, you know. First class travel. It was it was, thing. it was yeah. fantastic. The Regency Hotel. How can this what could possibly go wrong? Um, and, and literally what's that? Who wrote that? Well, I had a little something to do with them. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't want this story to, to, to drag on too long, but I um, I got a phone call from Barry one day asking me to come over to his office. And he proposed that I leave the movie business and, and basically start to build a proper marketing department for the Fox network. This was in 1988. The, the network had been up and running for a year. They started, you probably remember, with Joan Rivers, and then they programmed Saturday and Sunday night, and it was a disaster. Anyway, um, uh, he asked me to do this, and I ran uh, to my friend, uh, in the movie business, a gentleman named Tom Sherrick, may he rest in peace, who went on to run the Motion Picture Academy. And, and he had originally hired me as an intern. Uh, and I said, uh, Barry's asked me to do this. What do I do? And he put his arm around me and said, kid, I don't want to lose you. But if Barry asks you to do something, you got to go do it. But if I were you, I would um, tell him that if the network fails, and it, and it already has, Right, and that was the scuttlebutt. 
right, inside the company, um, you want to be able to come back to the movie business. Um, and, and so I, I had that, that conversation with him, and he said, don't worry, we'll always have a, a movie company. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, and it was, he wasn't wrong about right. that. Um, a- anyway, um, my first day on the job, uh, there was a screaming headline in Daily Variety that says, uh, Fox loses $99 million. News Corp considers shuttering the network. <laughs> day one. <laughs> And he had asked me to take a look at some. You promos. can imagine Sherrick reading this headline and just snickering, you know, like. Actually, right. Leonard Goldberg was the one snickering. Oh right, right. right and of may, he, he actually. He was the but, chairman of the Motion Picture Union. Right, right. And, and apparently donated a, a, a lot of money recently to UCLA. Oh, good for him. Great. Um, anyway, uh, so so he had asked me to take a look at some promos of of some shows, and I looked at the promos and I said, "Look, Barry," and it was the first time I met Jamie Kellner. Uh, and I said, Barry, I, I, like, I think that the promos are okay. They're a little bit inside themselves. Um, uh, but I think you have a bigger problem. And he said, well, what is that? And I said, well, when you run these promos on your own air, it's tantamount to talking to yourself because you have no <laughs> circulation. And, and he said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, and that's actually the He's, way he speaks. Yeah, no, he speaks uh, much tougher than right. that, honestly. And, and I said, well, I think we have to get off our own air and, and buy radio and whatever little cable existed in the day. Which was, wasn't something that was conventionally done at that nobody, time. Networks nobody did. were completely self-contained in their promotion. You Correct. watched NBC, and then NBC would tell you what its next Correct. series was going to be. Correct. So, so I, uh, I said, you know, I, I, I need like $5 million. And he looked at me and he said, do you not read? <laughs> <laughs> That's a real Barry moment, by the way. That's and, and, and I said, well, if you're referring to variety, um, I, I do. And, and, and this is where, you know, everybody's had careers, you know, you have seminal moments. Um, something came out of me which would never come out of me today because I'm too smart today. <laughs> it, it was the, the ignorance of youth. Um, and, I, and I looked at him, and he's a very intimidating figure, and I said, well, if, if you're not going to give me any money, then I can't help you, so I may as well go back to the movie business. And there was silence. And I could see Jamie looking at Barry. He just <laughs> was like, what was this, what, how violent could this reaction actually get? You know, in, if this was done in TV, there'd be, a, well, there'd be a voice in the background going, oh, no, he didn't. Yes, <laughs> right, correct, correct. And, and Barry just started to smile. And um, he liked the fact that I stood up to him. Um, but then he became Barry. He said, I'll tell you what. You go away, make your little radio ads and your little TV guide ads and your little cable ads, and come back, and we'll look at them. And Mr. Kellner Kellner and I will decide if we want to spend some money or no money. Off you go. (laughs) Literally. Off you go. Right. And I walked out of his office, and I'm in the hallway, and I'm thinking, how did this all <laughs> go so wrong? <laughs> Why did I open my big mouth? I, right, but No, I was in the movie business. I wasn't bothering anybody. <laughs> um, in, in any event, uh, it, 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 now things it, worked it, out okay. What's interesting is, you know, what I, what I flashed on as you were telling me this story right here on this uh, little podium is... You know, you talk about the arrogance of youth. You know, imagine Mark Zuckerberg turning down. Well, ignorance, <laughs> and maybe both. Chutzpah uh, would yeah. be the technical term, I think. You know, right. chutzpah, because you had chutzpah in that. It's like the chutzpah of Mark Zuckerberg saying, I'm turning down your $5 billion offer. I'm turning down your $10 billion offer. Nope, nope, nope. You know, there is something that is an ingredient in that kind of breakout success of a young executive, and you were obviously a, a practicing Yeah, I, I would say that I was on the cusp at the moment. <laughs> I was not exactly Mark Zuckerberg. Well, but, but, you, but also, you know, I think somebody like Barry was probably, at that point, he's like, boy, this guy well, that, that has was, a plan, that and was he it. has ideas, and he he's not just looking to fill in the boxes, because I think 
that's every executive's worst nightmare, I think, is when they get somebody that's just like, wants to do it like it's always been done and, you know, and is looking for the, right. you know, the tried and true approach. And, and to be fair, he needed somebody to, to stand up Shake to things up, right. But, but um, I, I did the work, yeah. right? And, and again, this was, the, the thing that he believed in was uh, you were always better off working with somebody who'd never done it before. Because we believe people had hardening of the categories. So if you've done it for, A term we learned here, by the way. Right. If you've done it yeah. for 10, 15, 20 years, you're stuck. You're no good. You're doing it the way everybody else is doing it. So I want somebody who's never done it before, right? And in fact, that's exactly what happened because I walked back to my office, again, thinking that I was screwed, um, and there was no marketing department. There was nobody to turn to to start to put together this creative. So what I did was I called all the, the vendors, the trailer companies that I had you know, worked with on the feature film side, and I said, get over here fast. And, and they came over, and um, what I realized was that we were never going to have enough money to sell our shows um, individually. So we lumped together Sunday night comedies. You guys remember... Married with Children and the Tracy Ullman Show. Uh, Which and started a, The Simpsons right. as a little one-minute cartoon inside it. Right. And it's the Gary Shandling Show, which was a second run off of Showtime. And Duet, uh, a woman named Ellen DeGeneres, had a very little role in that show. But, but I had no capacity to sell all of those shows. So what I decided to do was, was um, take a, a full-page you know, TV Guide ad, do little postage-size... Um, images at the very base of the ad of, of those four shows and sort of um, uh, referred to them as, as the Sunday funnies. And I'm sure you remember that, that famous Tammy Faye Baker shot and her husband when they were disgraced with the mascara, you know, running down. So I said, why, why don't we use that and make that three quarters of the ad with a headline that reads, now that they're gone, we're the funniest thing on television. <laughs> and and which was know. not just which was not just funny and memorable, but it established a brand position vis-a-vis -vis the other networks, which were all sort of yeah. you know Correct. very sort of pretentiously classy and yeah. you know as Fox was in your face saying I didn't know. have hardening of the categories. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, you were it, just looking, and you were also looking to get some attention. Correct. Just let's let's hey let's blow this thing out. And, and he, you know, he flipped for it, and he gave me some money, and we spent some money, and we did a test in 10 markets to see how sensitive our programming was to off-network promotion. Shows like 21 Jump Street, gave us Johnny Depp, um, Married with Children, and um, we all came in Monday morning, and, and the markets that, that we spent on were like that. And Barry called my office. He essentially said, all right, kid, I'm driving. You get in the passenger seat. Now we're going to build a network. Yeah, that's exciting. And, you know, then. Now, you know, I, 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 as I was listening to that, you know, interestingly, where's Tim? Uh, you know, it's like you had a classic example of, you know, a test case scenario, you know, running a, a classic scientific experiment. What does this affect? We'll keep all the other... Uh, variables the same, and we'll try these markets. We're going to put this money into promotion. The interesting thing is, I found when I started at NBC um, that uh, one the one department that most of the creative and marketing people were most terrified of was the research department, because right. the research guy would come in there, and you know Barry Diller famously referred to the department as witch doctors, <laughs> which I, with great contempt in his voice. But usually, I, I felt coming with this background, it never intimidated me at all. I'm like, I'm like. Well, what were your questions? Who did you talk to? You know, I was starting to, uh, and suddenly you realize everybody else looked panicked, and I never felt panicked because I was like, no, I, I understand this. I've had four years of taking this, you know, taking this stuff on tests. So this doesn't, you know, that was one thing where I, right. I felt very, in, very insecure about many things, but not that thing. <clears throat> did, did you find that sort of gave you some, some, uh, some advantages? Well, I, I, I'm going to answer the question a, a different way. Um, you know, this is a raging. Um, battle in, in in the business today um, with what's going on with you know data and analytics. I mean the beauty of of the digital world is is the ability um, you know to know exactly 
uh, who's clicking on your ads and 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 who's doing what. Uh, and you know, you got these established media companies, and and I think there's some righteousness um, to this. They feel like they're in the business of creating art. They don't want to be bothered by data and analytics, right? And and that's well and good, but look at what Ted Sarandis is doing at Netflix. I mean, you know, this is a guy who who is, you know, studying data driven company. Correct. Right. Correct. Algorithms. Uh, and and it's starting it's starting to creep in. But, but I'll tell you, it is dangerous. I mean, I, before I, I, I went over the network, again, I was in the movie business, and this is when I was very young. Um, I think I was maybe like 25 at the time. And we uh, had a movie. Um, it wasn't even finished yet. Um, and we did some test ads for it. And uh, all the feedback came back, and these were focus groups, right, because that's all you sort of right. could do. And the feedback was there wasn't a human being alive that wanted to see an action movie with Bruce Willis in it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we all in the marketing department, our first reaction was, oh, this is going to be our fault. Yeah. Right? Well, blame so this on us. Blame it on the marketing department. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, my reaction was, because I was so young, like, how is it possible that the the production department didn't do some research, right? It's insane that they made this movie with Bruce Willis in it. Um, and lo and behold, Die Hard worked out okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, you got to tell the audience what, what you know, what, what they want. What did research get wrong? Why? Why, why did that? Because oh, I actually, I, I mean, you know, many times what happens is the, I, I, I heard one of the Zucker brothers talking about making Airplane and <coughs> Apparently, Jeffrey Katzenberg hated it, according right. to him, and, and everybody thought it was going to be the biggest turkey, and the producers went back and, and cut 20 minutes out of the movie, just trying to, and did a test screening, and the test screening went so well that they got right. Paramount to release it, and the rest is history with Airplane. W what is it, what is it that, uh, yeah, I don't because you would think you'd put it in front of a few test audiences, and the audiences are going to say, yeah, this is really good. We liked it. Well, uh, I'm talking about test ads. You're talking about oh, test ads. Yeah, I'm okay. talking about print okay. ads. So oh, this is before understood. we showed we showed film. Yeah, got right? it. Right, but but look, I mean, I think that that just proves the point, right? Which is there is some magic to this. Yeah. Right. It's it it can't all be data driven, and yet people in the entertainment business today who are completely you know, turning a blind eye to, to, to the data and analytics that are now available to them yeah. are fools also. Yeah, right. So, exactly. you know, there's this tension that, you know, that, that's, that takes place inside these media companies today that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, um, one of the, you worked for one of the legendary disruptors, Rupert Murdoch, uh, a, a very different personality from Barry, but in many ways kind of, you know, they were both sort of disruptive types yeah. and they delighted in upending yeah. uh, existing industries. Tell us a little bit about working with Rupert and, and the kind of input he would give that uh, illustrates what his brilliance is. It was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it was, no, he's a tough guy to work for, right? Genius, mm -hmm. right? Too left beat creatively, mm -hmm. right? He just, he didn't, he didn't get the creative process like Barry did. Barry was left brain, right brain, like Peter Chernin, right? right? Uh, Rupert, forget about it, you know, no, no creative instincts. But what was so interesting about, about all of this, um, if we're going to be honest about the way you know, the story gets told, nobody knew um, what Fox ought to be when they raised the curtain on it. You know, you take it was Rupert very Murdoch. The very first day was very conventional. Rupert Murdoch, Barry Diller, two of the smartest guys who've ever worked, I would say, in business, right? Yeah. Forget about the entertainment business. Right. They went out and they programmed a bunch of very conventional shows to compete with what was then a three-network economy, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And they went out and bought shows that were actually quite similar. Patty Duke, Karen Song, Bill Bixby, and uh, Beans Baxter. Duet. Du George C. Scott in, and, Mr. in Mr. President. Mr. President. Right. And America basically said, are you kidding we are not going to channel 65 on our UHF dial and taking We're not out, adjusting the coat and, hanger and taking to that out the tin frequency. foil 
for that stuff, right? right? Um, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't until, you know, we started to get a little bit of a blip out of 21 Jump Street uh, and a little bit of a blip out of, out of Married with Children, and then, of course, really The Simpsons, that we had the aha moment, which was that there was an entire audience in America that had actually been disenfranchised by the TV industry, right? There were young people who were not really interested in watching The Cosby Show, right, in, in its day. Uh, and, and so... <laughs> or at least after a while. Right. right. And, so, and so we kind of stumbled into it, right? And that, the story rarely gets told that right. way. It was, yeah. We knew exactly <laughs> what we were doing, yeah. right? Well, the, uh, I, I remember that when Married with Children was in development, because I was friendly with the guys who created it, the, 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 the shorthand was not the Cosbys. Yeah, well, it, was, it was, they ain't the Huxtables. Right. right? Yeah, was, exactly. Yeah, which, 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 was, which was the, um, you know, the line. When you look at that period of your life, any favorite other people to work with, any, any, any stand out to you as, wow, I got a chance to do a show with so-and-so, or I got a chance, you know, you were the guy who greenlit Chris Carter in his first original series. Yeah, I, I guess the one standout, and it's because I had some experience working with him in the movie business, so I had a relationship with him, was, was Jim Brooks, right? I mean, you know, as a fan of Terms of Endearment, um, you know, he made movies about people. I'd still wish he would make movies about people. Um, I'm so tired of hardware. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know he he created the Simpsons, and what was what was his genius as you looked at it? What was it that he did that was particularly special and and singular relative he, to people he, who do he, that? He he understood pathos. They always said that what he brought. What I always heard about the Simpsons was he's the one who brought the heart. You know, if you look it's at Matt Groening, great. it's funny. Sam Simon, very who was another one of the people involved in the creation of it. Very edgy, very caustic. That's it's where true. you get that kind of hip, edgy kind of humor coming from those things. But it was it was Jim Brooks who said, "You've got to put heart in this. You've got to have if you go this back, family has to love each other." Yeah. If you go back to the very first episode, the special called "Santa's Little Helper," um, with with the dog that yeah. that ran away. That was all Jim. I mean, that made you feel right. right? Yeah. Um, and and he's just you know, and I'd worked with him on broadcast news. Right. Right on the feature film side. Oh, so yeah. so Pretty transitioning nice. from that to The Simpsons was was great um, was great fun for me. Did you have any, what with the Star Wars on my mind, uh, did you have any Darth Vaders in your life? Did you have any adversaries that, oh my God. that kind of, that kind of, any, any, that, how that, much that time do you guys have? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about some encounters with some great adversaries. Well, it was your, Rupert. On your way up. It was, yeah. it was, it was Rupert, Rupert, and Rupert. Right. You know, he would come into my office at 8 o'clock in the morning and um, give me grief about something, right? And it didn't matter how good the ratings were the night before. They should always be better. They should always be better. Isn't that something? Right? And I had, it was very unfortunate. You talk about a rough break. My office was in between his and Cherny's. So every time he wanted to go see, and as Peter, I recall, they were literally interconnecting. Was it that those interconnecting offices on the? No, same they floor? weren't interconnecting, but but they were close right, enough. Yeah. Right. And so essentially, every time Rupert wanted to go see Peter, he couldn't stop himself from stopping off into my office, <laughs> and and it was never good news. It well, was so it was never right. So so I, I'll give you one. Uh, we bought this show called American Idol. And um, I uh, desperately wanted to try to get Simon Cowell to make a multi-year deal, right? To come from the UK to the United States to do the American version. We didn't know it was going to be successful, right? In fact, there was a meeting where Peter Chernin, you know, had a bunch of us in his in his office like three months before the launch, and we were talking about whether or not we were going to spend any off-network dollars on it. And Peter leaned back like this and said, is there anybody in this room who thinks this thing's anything other than a poor man's star search? <laughs> and there is not a hand that went up in the room. Right? I always love those stories right? because, you know, it's, it's the William Goldman adage. Nobody knows anything about time. anything in Hollywood. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and uh, Jeff Zagansky, the way he put it, was all hits are flukes. Yeah. I, I thought that was another good one. I, I, I um, agree. 
I, I, I have a couple of sort of classic questions, like biggest risk you ever took, and did it work out? Biggest risk I ever took, did it ever work out? Wow. Um, you know, this is going to sound really silly, right? And and this is is the first one that comes to mind. And these right. are the kinds of things you have to deal with when you're in one of those jobs. So I had breakfast with a gentleman named Chuck Rosen, who I think is a UCLA graduate. Chuck was running 90210 for us, and 90210 was a was a big hit television show. Right. And um, it took a while for the show to catch on in, it, in its first season. Um, so as, as summer was sort of coming along, um, it was really, it, it, it was starting to get momentum. And I didn't want the show to stop. I didn't want to take it off the air and hang up the gone fishing sign the way all the networks did at the end of the May sweeps, only to come back again in September. I wanted to keep it going. But it was insane to make an expensive scripted show and air it in the summer. Uh, and, and it took a lot of convincing, first the production, because they were exhausted. They wanted no part of it. Right. But the other thing about Fox is I always knew that we could gain ground on the big three when they were, when they were going dark. Right, so right. so you Insur wanted a zig. insurgent strategy. You wanted yeah. a zig while it, while they were zagging, and and I remember having a meeting with with Rupert, and Barry was long gone at this point, and Chernin had gone to the. Barry film. had left uh, the entire uh, t TV yeah. and film business. He bought QVC, and he went on to Correct. sort of create uh, a Correct. big a big uh, digital right. media. Company. And 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 Peter Chernin had gone to the film business to replace. Joe Roth, which is how I became president. Um, and one of the first meetings I had was with Rupert. And I said, Rupert, um, we are going to, I just want you to know, we're going to make uh, summer episodes of 90210. Um, Brandon, the name of Jason Priestley's character, is going to uh, work at a beach club. Uh, and it's going to be fun in the sun. And he looked at me so disdainfully. <laughs> and, and, and basically said, like, no advertiser wants to spend money in the summer? Yeah. Well, so it, was, it, it, it paid off big time, right? Well, it, it paid off big time. But, you know, again, I mean, he's a pretty smart guy. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Um, I personally would always rather learn from someone else's mistakes. So if I can embarrass you and say, can you tell us about some mistakes of significance that you might have made and what you learned from those? Mm. <laughs> you haven't made many as the, uh, you know, as these uh, scores are kept. You know, I, this is actually particularly embarrassing because um, I, I so mishandled it. Um, you know, we had a show called uh, Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire? And, and I, I had run the network when I was young, when I was 32, 33, 34. Then I went and I ran and I moved and I, I ran the television studio for three, four years. And then my penance for having done a decent job at that. <laughs> um, and because, you know, uh, the network had kind of lost its way a little bit and, and got mired into all of this reality, lowbrow reality programming, like when animals attack and world's wildest police videos. Rupert, that, that's Rupert and lowbrow. Yeah, Rupert and Peter said, "You got to come back and you got to fix this." So I was on the job for like you know a month. I hadn't even caught up with what was on the air. Right? right, So this show took me by surprise. Because mm -hmm. right? I was thinking long term, how am I going to fix this thing? Right. I wasn't looking at what we were doing three this, weeks from yeah. that. Right. Right? And I was at home and I was watching this thing. And, and I was lifting my jaw up off the floor. <laughs> and my phone was ringing. This was pre-social media. Yeah. Right? I, my parents called. My sister <laughs> called. Everybody's like, what are this you doing? This is a doing? Shonda. Like, right. what? Okay. I, 
are you out of your mind? And 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 I went in the next day, and uh, yeah, I mean it was it was um, huge. And and Rupert called, and it was like, well, we got to do it as a series. Right? That was all. It's like, oh god. Um, and and so anyway, uh, I decided, okay, we're going to rerun this right the following Tuesday. So it's a weekend. And it's Sunday afternoon, and I'm at home, and I'm watching football, and I get a phone call from our head of publicity who says that Bill Carter from the New York Times is calling about something that's appeared on the Smoking Gun website that um, Rick Rockwell, who was the man, uh, and Darva Conger, right, they went on a cruise together because he picked her. And apparently, without our knowing it, he had a restraining order against him because he had beaten the hell out of, you know, his ex-girlfriend or whatever. And I was, oh, my God. Right? So I immediately said, all right, we're not rerunning this. Right? And, and I was getting a lot of heat in town from, like, Brian Lowry of the Los Angeles Times. Like, what's wrong with you guys? And, and this, this was early days of, of unscripted television. We were, you know, right. it, we, were, we were just learning. Um, I mean, today, no one would bat an eye. Well, and t- and, well, true. And today, they would have background checks on everybody a million ways from Sunday before they even <coughs> yeah, correct. get anywhere near. And, and it'd air. still be right. problematic. Yeah. Anyway, um, long story short, uh, I, I felt like we were getting killed and, and, and you know, we were irresponsible. So I got on the phone with Bill Carter. And, and I said, Bill, we're never doing this kind of crap again. It's over. It's done. You know, this lowbrow stuff. This sounds like a setup. Never again. Next day, not the business section, the front page of the New York Times, Fox's Grusho swears off reality. Oh, my. Right? Yeah. Um, what was Rupert's reaction to the story? Well, I, I didn't hear from Rupert. Right, I did hear from Peter. Yep. who said, "You know, Sammy, that may have been a little extreme." <laughs> right? You know, we are. You know, we should be able to program. You know, populist entertainment. And I said, y- "You know, you're right. Um, I was definitely an overreaction on on my part, and I paid the price because, lo and behold, you know, several months later, we aired Temptation Island, <laughs> right? And I had to sit in front of you know the press at, yeah. at the TCA." Tour. And, and and every single one of them, they were just sharpening their knives. <laughs> like, didn't you say? And, and, and I had to sit there and go like, you know, you got to give them what they want, right? You know, I have a fiduciary responsibility <laughs> to News Corp, right? Yeah. To give them what it's, they it's want. It's like, a, yeah, you should have a magic eight ball of responses for something like that. But I have you, a fiduciary responsibility. But, but, but if I yeah. could have if I could have wound back time, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. conversation with Bill Carter never would have happened. Right, exactly. And that was, that was pretty humiliating. <laughs> um, uh, tell us a little bit about, as you look back, we're, we're here at UCLA, our beloved alma mater. Uh, does some things stand out that you really appreciate about your experience here and, and how that may have uh, helped you in, uh, in your career? You know, uh, lots of students have actually asked me that question this week. And I wish that I could say, sorry about this, that there was one class um, that, that lit a fuse. I, I just, I, I took it seriously when I, when I got here. I, I worked really hard. I, I was really dedicated. Um, I sacrificed a lot. I didn't have nearly as much fun as, in retrospect, I ought to have had. But what I was doing was I was readying myself for, um, you know, starting at Fox as, as an intern. And it didn't occur to me, like, the idea of being the first one in and, and the last one to leave. Um, I had, I had already intellectually, emotionally, and, and physically, you know, pr- you know, prepared myself for, um, you know, for what would become a pretty all-consuming, um, pretty all-consuming life. So I say it, it, it taught me 
my years here taught me discipline and the, work and the value of work ethic <clears throat> and the value of, you know, of sacrifice. Right. Were there any professors or classes that Marty Gregory. <laughs> and, and seriously, and why? Besides well, the fact we love her, but why? You know, look, the, the reality is that, that school is school. Academics is academics. But, you know, everybody goes to school in preparation for having a, a real life out in the world. And, and it wasn't until, you know, we started doing internships and, and actually, you know, taking what we were given from this place, and we were privileged, um, out into the world that, that it, it really, you know, it really felt um, fulfilling. I was telling Tim that uh, Marty was very, very tough. You know, she was she certainly loved her students, but she was... You know, she would really get in your face. Well, if she you, prepared you weren't... me for Rupert and, Murdoch. Absolutely. No, it's true. I think that Marty was the only person who came close to like a Barry Diller. She was Diller. my Darth Vader well, at UCLA. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, Peter, are we um, are we are we wrapping up here? Well, it's been a total pleasure, Sandy. Thank I you so much for doing this. I didn't get to ask you the questions I wanted to ask you. Ha ha. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. That went fast. So I appreciate your guys' sacrifice and your diligence coming back here. Um, that was a great talk. I also want to present Sandy with a engraved Bruin bear that was hidden here in the podium. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, to thank him for his invaluable contribution to UCLA and in his participation in the Bruin in Residence program. Thank so, you very much. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it.